If you were to ask me what the best camera to buy right now is, I would say this camera, the camera that I'm filming on. That camera is the Canon R5. And even though it's a few years old, the camera has had multiple updates that have allowed it to stay at the top of the hybrid camera list. That might catch you off guard because there are newer cameras, faster cameras, higher resolution cameras, or cameras with better video features. So why am I recommending the Canon R5? Well, at its current price point, it's the best camera for me. So let's unpack that. I'll share some photo and some video examples. We'll talk about the good, the bad, the ibis wobbles, <laughs> and some things that you might not know about the Canon R5. So why did I buy the Canon R5? Well, last year I was looking for a second camera body and I had an R6 at the time and the option I had was to get another R6 or potentially something different. And that's when I started looking at the R5. Now I had big anxiety about spending that much money on a camera, but the reason that I ultimately decided to do it was one, I wanted a camera that had 4K, 120 frames per second for those rare circumstances when you actually need that many frames per second. I also wanted a camera that could shoot longer in 24 frames per second without overheating because the R6 tends to tap out at around 30, 38 minutes, whereas the R5 can record continuously in 24 frames per second without having any issues. I also wanted a camera where the depth of field matched. So I didn't want to go with a crop sensor camera like the R7, but I specifically wanted a camera with hybrid functionality. I also looked at the Canon R5C as a hybrid photo video option, but because I'm more of a photo first shooter, it didn't really fit the bill of what I was looking for in a hybrid camera. So what is a hybrid camera? On one hand, you have photo cameras, and on the other hand, you have video cameras. Now, most mirrorless cameras can do both at the same time, but there's a spectrum of hybrid cameras, ones that are more video centric and others that are more photo centric. With Canon cameras, they tend to be photo first cameras where all their cameras are really great photo features, but then some cameras have more video features than others if that makes sense. The big takeaway here is to look at the resolution of the sensor and how that translates into video resolution. So 12 megapixels is gonna get you 4K, 24 megapixels is gonna start to creep you into that 6K territory, like the R6 Mark II or the R3, and then 45 megapixels, like the Canon R5, that's when you get into the 8K video range. Let's compare some Canon cameras to some Sony cameras. One of the cameras you might be looking at is the A7 IV. It's a really great hybrid photo video option, but because the R5 is a more expensive camera, a lot of its features outrank the Sony A7 IV. Specifically, it has a higher resolution sensor. It can do higher resolution photos and videos. The Canon R5 also has no crop in video mode, which is something that was really important as a hybrid shooter so that when you have a lens attached and you're switching from photo to video mode, the crop or the framing of what you're shooting doesn't change. A more fair comparison would probably be the Canon R5 versus the Sony a7R5 because both of those cameras are priced very similarly. If you wanna see a direct comparison between both of those cameras, let me know in the comments below. My friend Rich actually just got that camera. So I've had a little bit of time to see how the autofocus works and have those two cameras side by side and compare some of those photos. One of the challenges with the Sony a7R5 is when you switch into those higher resolution, higher frame rate video modes, you do start to introduce that crop factor. This is where the Canon R5 shines. It has no crop, but neither does the more expensive Canon R3. But the R3 is a lower resolution camera, but it's 
more expensive. Well, that's because the R3 is designed for photographers who are shooting really high speed action. The sensor on the R3 is 24 megapixels, which allows it to be a lot faster. If you're shooting sports or action or something that requires a really fast readout of your camera's sensor. And the R3 is also a bigger body, so it can dissipate the heat longer, which allows you to have longer recording times. Although with the R5, with some of the latest updates with the high temperature heat mode, I personally have never experienced any overheating, at least not in my use case. Then you have the Canon R6 Mark II, which is about 90% the same camera as the Canon R5, but at a much lower price point. What it lacks is the all eye or all intra video mode, which is a higher quality, lower compression video file, which I usually don't shoot in. The one thing I really love about the Canon R5 is the custom modes. That's one thing you don't get with the R6 II the R6, the R8, and all those cameras that don't have that digital screen. The digital screen, instead of being fixed to specific modes, allows you to set custom modes both for your photo and for your video so that you can switch really quick between a whole bunch of preset settings. But what about the R5C? It's actually one of the cameras that when I was first deciding to get another camera that I had looked at, I actually went and tested it at one of the Canon road trip events. The big deal breaker for me, actually there was two was the fact that the battery life is only about 30 minutes and that's just because it really is designed to be used with like an integrated or like an external battery so that you can power it for longer which means it doesn't really work well for gimbal scenarios like if you're shooting weddings or video projects where you need your camera to be lightweight and mobile the r5c also doesn't have in-body image stabilization which was the second deal breaker that can be good for video shooting because you don't get those corner wobbles, but for photo shooting, it really does help if you're trying to do stuff that's handheld or photos that are at a more zoomed in telephoto, like 200 millimeters, because it allows you to handhold it and really stop down your shutter speed. So then what about the C70? If you're someone who's really interested in the R5 for its video features, the, the 8K and all the frame rates, then you might be tempted by the C70, which is a dedicated cinema camera camera in that kind of compact hybrid mirrorless body. The C70 has raw video, it has raw light, which is really awesome. It also has the dual gain output sensor, which is really great if you're shooting in like lower light scenarios and you wanna get that cleaner excuse me, that cleaner looking footage. But with the C70 and the R5C, you're really pushing into that video specific territory. For me, being a photo first shooter, the R5 really does make the most sense. Now, all the photos you're seeing in this video have been edited with my Lightroom presets. And whether you're shooting Canon, Sony, Nikon, or Fuji, all of my presets are designed to work on photos from any camera. Now, when I'm editing my photos, even if I'm not using presets, I still like to start with presets as a way to give me an idea of what the edit could look like. So whether you're experienced or you're brand new to Lightroom, presets are a great way to save time. Most of my edits, if I'm doing them from scratch, take me like 15, 20 minutes. But if I'm using a preset, I can cut that way down to like, five minutes for a single photo or even less. So if you're interested in saving time editing your photos, you can check out my presets linked down, down here, down there somewhere. <laughs> Let's talk about some photo specific features of the Canon R5. Right off the bat, it is a 45 megapixel sensor, which in my opinion is probably as big as I would need to go. Again, coming from the R6 and now having the R6 Mark II, 24 megapixels is a really nice round resolution. The pictures come out at 6,000 by 4,000, whereas with the R5, you're looking at what, 8,100, 8,192 by 5,400. 464. So even though the megapixels are almost twice as much as the R6 Mark II, the resolution is only about another 2000 pixels in the horizontal dimension, which might be too much resolution depending on what you're doing. I find if you're someone who nails your composition every time, or if you're someone who's doing a lot of photos, like for a wedding or for events or for motorsports, having 8000 pixels, unless you're doing like a really high resolution art print, 
is probably way more than you need. It really goes without saying that every camera you buy these days has pretty much all the features built in. Exposure bracketing, focus bracketing, interval timer, mechanical shutter, which is something that the R5 and the R6 and the R3 have, which is also something that might be going away on future cameras because the readout of the sensor is just so fast. But really quickly, the biggest features I look for in a camera are, does it have a dedicated knob for the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter settings so that you can change them really quick? Is the autofocus good? Which goes without saying, anything built within the last probably six years really does have amazing autofocus. Except maybe Nikon. <laughs> joking, I'm joking. And then there's the dreaded lens options. Let's talk about lens ecosystems. Inexpensive lenses are a big deal, especially when you're just getting started. With Canon, there aren't a lot of inexpensive lens options unless you wanna go with older EF lenses and get an adapter. But here's the thing, if you're in the price range of buying a 3,000, 4,000, or in my case, $5,000 Canadian camera, you're probably in the same market as someone who's ready to buy expensive first-party RF lenses. But if you're not, and you're someone who's maybe looking at an, an R6 Mark II, or an R10, or something that's a little bit less expensive, expensive, lenses are a big deal. Now, later this year, Sigma is reportedly gonna be coming out with their first lenses for the RF system. I don't have any information about this. I don't know anything that you don't already know. So maybe by the time you're watching this, there are already some inexpensive lens options. But that being said, there are some inexpensive RF Canon made lenses. And if you wanna check out which ones I recommend, you can check out this video here for the 35 millimeter, which is a fantastic lens because it's got that low aperture setting. There's also the 50 millimeter and the 24 millimeter. But if you're looking for a telephoto lens or a, like a 24 to 70 2.8 that's less expensive than the $3,000 ish Canon one then you might be out of luck. Now, personally, I've shot all of my photos on RF native glass. When I made the switch to the Canon R5, I made that decision that I was gonna sell off all my EF lenses so that I could have lenses that I didn't need a lens adapter to actually run them. The other advantage is that the RF lenses do have that third ring that you can program to do like whatever you want. You can control aperture, you can control ISO, you can control pretty much any of the settings on the camera that you could set to like a normal dial you can set to that ring on the camera. Now, have I ever used it in a serious way? Not really, but it is a fun feature if it's something you're considering. When it comes to video features, the Canon R5 pretty much has everything that you would need as a hybrid photo video shooter. It even has raw video, which is Honestly, something I've, I've only used once just because the video files are so large. And even though the R5 has that higher quality all intra or all eye video mode, I find most of the time I end up using IPB because it fits right in that pocket of quality and file size. Like the files aren't too large and the quality isn't diminished enough where I feel like I need to shoot on all intra to get those larger video files. And then there's the IBIS wobbles, which everyone freaks out about. It's, it's when the corner starts to shake a little bit because of the in-body image stabilization. And usually it occurs at 15 millimeters or 16 millimeters when you're shooting those really wide kind of like vlog style segments where you're, you're kind of shaking with the camera. Now, in my tests, if you zoom in the lens a little bit and you know go past 16 millimeters, maybe it's like 18 millimeters, you don't notice that jello effect as much. The trade-off here is that Canon does a really good job at stabilizing the center of the frame. Like when you look at this test footage, if you were to crop out the edges, the center looks pretty good. And keep in mind, this is only something that will affect video shooters. With photo shooters, IBIS is something that's not gonna negatively impact your photos because your photos aren't moving, they're just static. Let's talk about some features of the R5 that 
absolutely rock. The first is that it has the same camera body profile as both the R6 and the R6 Mark II, which probably doesn't sound too exciting at first, but the nice thing is that means you can share camera grips or cages or all the same sort of accessories. Also, it has the 400 megapixel stitch, IBIS stitch mode, which is a little bit of a novelty because right now you can only do it in JPEG. Like there's no raw version of that feature. When we were at the Grand Canyon and in Utah and Arizona a couple months ago, I actually tested it and did some A and B shots where one was a raw and one was the stitched pano. Now when you're shooting in ideal lighting conditions, Shooting with JPEG is, is, is okay, but it's not ideal. Having this feature in RAW would be absolutely incredible. I don't think we're gonna get it on the R5, but I do expect it in whatever camera that Canon releases next. Also, custom functions. This is something that most people, until you get to the higher end cameras, won't really appreciate or won't even really think about needing. But on the Canon R5, there's a button on the front that allows you to switch, or you can really program it to do anything. But what I've programmed it to do is switch between photo and video mode. So whereas on the R6 and the R10, or the R6 II and the R10, there's this dial that allows you to switch from from photo to video mode, which is great in theory. I, I find it's a little bit inconvenient to use compared to a button that's just already right by your shutter finger. Also, the high temperature overheating mode. That's something that was introduced with the latest firmware. That means that the camera pretty much no longer overheats in 4K60, or at least not in my use case. The top screen is also an awesome feature that the R3, the R, and the R5 all share, that you can kind of see everything right at a glance, which some of the other cameras unfortunately don't have. Now, in the future, one thing I would really like to see on the R5 is the addition of unlimited record time. Apparently, we're gonna get that in a firmware update, but we haven't seen it yet, so fingers crossed, or maybe when you're watching this, that feature is already out. I don't really have any problems with the R5 other than the fact that the R6 Mark II now has some features that aren't in the R5 that are making me wish they were in the R5. One of the challenges that I face when using both of those cameras is that the top interface is different. The R6 Mark II has this new dial switch that allows you to switch between photo and video mode, and the power button is in a different location, which can sometimes confuse me when I'm picking up one camera versus the other, because in the hand, they feel the same. It's only when you go to flip the power switch that you realize, oh, I'm on the wrong camera. I'm on I'm on the R5. I've, I've just turned it off rather than switching from photo to video mode. So sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. So is it worth it to get the Canon R5? I think it depends on what type of photographer you are. And there are two scenarios. The first is if you're a professional photographer, then by all means, get it. It is a workhorse of a camera compared to something like the R3. The R3 is, is a very niche camera. The other case is if you're a casual photographer. If you are, then the R5 is probably a little bit too much of a camera for you. In that case, my recommendation would be something like the R6, R6 Mark II, the R10, the R50, something in that price category, because I think you'll get more out of your money investing in a slightly less expensive camera and then using the money that you've saved to invest it into something like higher quality lenses. But that's just my opinion. So I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you learned a little bit about the Canon R5, even though it's a camera that's been out for a while. Let me know down in the comments below. Do you wanna see more dedicated camera reviews, lens reviews like this? And, and not just Canon, maybe Fuji, Sony, Potato Cam? Anyways, that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. And in the meantime, go out, shoot some photos.